Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Path Forward. Today, we're delighted to welcome the CDC Director, Dr. Robert Redfield. The CDC, as you know, is the nation's health protection agency, working to save lives and defend Americans against dangerous threats and to respond with critical science and accurate information when those threats arise. As the head of the agency, Dr. Redfield has been one of the nation's leading voices during this pandemic, sharing new information, issuing public health guidance, and advising Americans about how to safely return to work, school, and daily life. We're glad to have him with him, what is sadly, have him with us at what is sadly a really pivotal moment in this crisis. Right now, as you all know, cases are spiking across the country. As a result, we're seeing some states resort to different types of lockdowns like we saw in the initial wave of the virus. And Americans everywhere are hungry for information and guidance about how to navigate the holiday season and an uncertain winter. Dr. Redfield will address all of these issues and more, and we'll We'll take questions from our audience as well. So without further ado, Dr. Redfield, welcome. What can you tell our audience about the current state of the pandemic? Well, thank you very much for having me. And we are at a very uh, pivotal time in this pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, we're experiencing a substantial surge across the nation where we now have really a significant number of our jurisdictions and states that are really in what we call the red zone. Uh, and uh, um, a wide uh, surge that happened in the heartland and the Northern Plains, which uh, really lasted a lot longer than say what we had with the spring and summer surge. The other thing, it had a much more steep trajectory. So when you looked at the the spring surge, this was sort of the rate of increase in the summer surge. And when we looked at this re more recent surge, this is really more what the rate of increase is. It's also lasting a lot longer. Usually it took us between four to five weeks before we hit a peak. Uh, now it's really this time it's closer to eight to 10 weeks. And in many areas we haven't peaked yet. Um, so we are at a very serious time. I guess the good news is the heartlands and the northern plains have started to decline and hit their peak. Um, but unfortunately, at the same time that's happening, the pandemic now is having a resurgence in Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, the mid-Atlantic states, the southern Sun Belt, also now moving back up into the northeast as well as unfortunately California, Oregon, and Washington. So we really have a very extensive uh, pandemic now uh, throughout the nation. I think many of you probably saw that in the month of November, unfortunately, we had over a million cases reported each week. So 4 million cases were reported in November. Unfortunately, our hospitalization rates are going up and maybe we'll talk more about that because that's one of our great concerns Whereas in the spring, we were talking about 20, 30,000 people in the hospital. Now we're over 90,000 people in our hospital. I think one of the most concerning things about understanding the, the impact of the pandemic right now, and there may be questions on it, is to recognize that as we sit here today, 90% of our hospitals in this nation are actually in what we call one of the hot zones, in the red zone. Uh, therefore, at risk for increased hospitalization and potential to negatively impact hospital capacity. 90% uh, of all of our long-term care facilities now are in what we call high transmission zones. So we are at a very critical time right now about being able to maintain the resilience of our healthcare system. In the spring, we were dealing with New York, Detroit, you know, uh, New Orleans, Los Angeles, we could shift healthcare capacity from one part of the country to the other. Um, we saw similar when we had the Southern wave, we could shift healthcare capacity from the heartlands and from the Northern Plains. Right now, we unfortunately have a pandemic that's really throughout the nation. And there really isn't that resilience of healthcare capacity to be able to be shifted uh, this is why it's so important at this time, and I know we'll talk more about it, is to really embrace the mitigation steps that we've tried to stress. Um, 
in the time for debating whether or not masks work or not is over. We clearly have scientific evidence. We just recently published an MMWR in Kansas when they came out with their mask mandate and certain uh, counties opted out and certain comp counties opted in. And when you compare those that opted in, they had a, about a 6% decrease in the observation period of new cases per 100,000. And of the counties that decided that they didn't think this was the way to go and opted out of the mask mandate, we found out that they had over 100% increase in the cases. You couple that with uh, social distancing, hand washing, being smart about crowds, uh, doing things more outside than inside. Uh, these are critical uh, mitigation steps to, which to many people seem simple and they don't really think it could have you know, much of an impact, but the reality is they're very, very powerful tools. They have an enormous impact. And right now it is so important that we recommit ourselves to this mitigation as we now begin to turn the corner with the vaccine. But the reality is December and January and February are gonna be rough times. I actually believe they're gonna be the most difficult time in the public health history of this nation, uh, largely because of the stress that it's gonna put on our healthcare system. It's a, it's, a, it's, a sobering, it's a sobering and important thought there. And, I, and there are a couple directions I wanna go. Let's start with some of the public health models looking at mortality rates have been really shocking. And so my question for you is what, what can we do to change that trajectory? And is it as simple as masks, social distancing, isolating, uh, et cetera. But what do we do to change what looks like a really terrifying trajectory? Well, I think you're right when you look at the different uh, models. You know, we looked at the original spring, we lost about 100,000 people, the summer 100,000 people, the fall 100,000 people. These are, you know, sacred lives that were lost as a consequence of this pandemic. We're potentially looking at, you know, another 150 to 200,000 people before we get into February. So this is really a, a significant time. And you asked the right question because we're not defenseless. The truth is mitigation works. And if we embrace it, and the challenge with this virus is it's not going to work if half of us do what we need to do. It's not even going to work probably if three quarters of us do what we need to do. This virus really is going to require all of us to really be vigilant about wearing a mask, you know, and unfortunately, not just when we're in the public square. I mean, we're finding now that much of the transmission that's driving, I mean, who would have believed that, you know, rural North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, these areas in North Dakota recently you know, over 30, 40% of the people that got tested were actually positive. And the reason this is happening because now one of the major drivers of transmission is not the public square, it's actually the home gatherings where people let down their guard. Uh, you know, you bring in family members and they don't realize that the major presentation of this virus for individuals say under the age of 40 is it's totally asymptomatic. You don't know you're infected. And really being able to get a handle on asymptomatic transmission in the family setting, which is now driving. And frequently we don't necessarily, communities don't recognize it until unfortunately that virus thing gets transmitted in somebody that's vulnerable, uh, older, and then they end up developing symptomatic illness and they end up um, in the hospital. So the reality is, as you saw just the other day, I think in, in our reports, we were back up to almost uh, um, 2,400 deaths uh, that were reported yesterday. Um, so we're in that range potentially now of starting to see 1,500 to 2,000 to 2,500 deaths a day uh, from this fire. So um, yeah, the mortality uh, concerns are real. Um, and I do think, unfortunately, before we see February, uh, we could be close to 450,000 Americans have died from this virus. But, you know, that's not a fait accompli. If the American public really embraces social distancing, 
wearing masks, not letting your guard down in family gatherings, um, limiting crowds, maintaining ventilation, uh, doing events outdoors rather than indoors, uh, making sure you're vigilant in hand, in hand hygiene. And that coupled with some strategies that we're pushing states to do to begin to diagnose through surveillance um, the asymptomatic infections will begin to help us. I give one example of hope because I used to think that the most difficult group that we were going to have to help contain this pandemic was basically college students, that I felt it was going to be very hard for us to be effective in getting them to fully embrace the messages that I just said. And in the spring, we had significant outbreaks on different college campuses. But what happened over the summer and the fall is many of the colleges and universities really stepped up to developing comprehensive mitigation steps that they really engaged the student body to actually buy into. And then they coupled that with screening the student body every week so they could identify the asymptomatic silent epidemic that was in, in the population and then pull them out for isolation and prevent them from further transmitting. If you look at it today, say Wisconsin, Governor Thompson, who's now the acting president, University of Wisconsin, um, they have a prevalence rate in their 27 campuses all through Wisconsin of students in the highest risk group, 18 to 25 year olds, their prevalence rates less than 3%. But when you look in the communities where they live, because most of these kids don't live on campus, their prevalence rate is between 10 and 20%. Oh. So it just reaffirms to me that mitigation can work. And even some of the, what your biases may be, the more difficult group to you know, participate, I can show you the same is true in the Northeastern schools, the same is true in the South Carolina schools. The idea that coupling mitigation with routine screening surveillance to be able to identify the asymptomatic carriers, these techniques do work and they're powerful. The truth is it's our defense against this. When you ask me the big question, how many people are gonna die between now and say February 1st? I'm gonna really come back and say, it's really up to us how vigilant people are gonna be about really taking to heart these mitigations. I, I think if I'm disappointed at one thing uh, during my time as CDC director during this pandemic was that there was an inconsistency of the American public embracing the message. Mask wearing, this mask wearing, it's not a political decision. This is a public health tool, a very powerful public health tool. Very simple, but very powerful. And yet we have really had, you know, taken a long time. And to this date, there are still jurisdictions probably on this uh, call that really don't embrace the importance of these mitigation steps. And I encourage people to look at the MMWR we put out in Kansas. I mean, it really showed the difference between a 6% decline or 100% increase by one simple thing, whether the county decided to embrace a mass mandate. That's really remarkable. And I think we can help you. We should help you get that get that message out. I'm going to turn to the first audience question in a minute. But let me first follow up on something you said. You talked about the importance or the efficacy, really, of surveillance. Um, by that, do you mean kind of the random testing or do you mean some of the sewage testing that we've seen on other college campuses? Or how, how do you define surveillance? Well, I think it's really important you know, if you want to take sort of a hindsight, the real question that is out there is how many, how much testing capacity do we really need as a nation to optimize our public health response? And, and I, I would say that um, that's more tests than we currently have. There's been a lot of focus on how many tests we have. Second thing I will say is how testing is used. Is it random? or is it strategic? Hmm. And we would argue right now, one of the big challenges that hit us with this COVID pandemic was we had modeled it, we had modeled it in our heads like SARS. 
or like influenza. And SARS and influenza, the way they work is they make you sick. So it's not that complicated for you to have a uh, case identification program that says, let's look at people who are sick and find out, do they have COVID-19 and then isolate contact trace in the control of the pandemic. The problem with COVID too, it's not like flu. It's not like SARS. It's major transmission, particularly in those of us say under the age of 45, is it's asymptomatic. So you don't know who's infected and who isn't. And so all of a sudden, that strategy of looking for symptomatic people, like we originally did in, in January and February, and telling symptomatic people to stay home and wear masks, that works for the symptomatic people. But the problem is you just miss 50% or more in certain age groups of the people that are carrying this virus. And so therefore, you've got to say, okay, well, wait a minute. How do we then define the silent epidemic? How do we define asymptomatic transmission? And we would argue, going back to the college campuses, they figured out by doing regular weekly screening of students, every week, they're able now to identify the asymptomatic carriers, or not carriers, asymptomatic infections, pull them out of the transmission cycle, isolate them, contact trace around them, and isolate those individuals, and they've been able to control the outbreak. So there, there has to be a strategic use of testing. We're right now, you know, you know Liverpool recently uh, in England decided, you know, what they were going to do to get a handle on this silent epidemic. They just tested everybody in Liverpool. And they figured out who was infected and been able to isolate. So we have areas now that we're trying to do what we call community-wide strategic testing, where they're hotspots to try to understand we're looking, uh, there'll be a CDC guidance coming out this week on trying to help um, institutions and public health groups, uh, 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 companies, uh, look at how they may be able to use routine screening. For example, we think it might be useful to uh, offer routine weekly screening for teachers in K through 12s. Others feel it might be useful to look at other people that have a lot of contact in the community with people and set them up for routine screening so that you can start to identify the silent epidemic. You'll see in this MMWR, we list a number of different strategies. Um, none of them are, you know, have been um, really proven in the sense that we know that this is the tool that's gonna now contain the epidemic, but we do know it's proven that they do help us identify the silent transmitters. And as I mentioned, I think the schools of higher learning uh, are teaching us something. I think they've been able to use testing strategically. Um, uh, it's actually very interesting. If you look at the colleges, universities that tested everybody routinely every week, or you compare that to people that tested everybody in contact traced around symptomatic cases and did that constantly, you'll see that this, the colleges that did the routine screening once a week had a far greater less occurrence of COVID within their population. So I just want people to know we do have tools. Uh, testing, I do think, needs to be more strategic. One of the challenges is a lot of people that choose to get tested are what we call the worried well. Uh, I do think it's important for us to be more strategic in our testing in terms of whether you set up a routine surveillance system once a week for uh, employees or some portion of employees so you get a sense of trying to understand is the silent epidemic now working? You've mentioned other techniques like wastewater. These are important things we've done in the college campuses, but I do think the biggest challenge right now um, is to identify the silent epidemic and to try to get that silent epidemic out of the transition cycle. Oh, I have so many questions. Okay, so first let me bring in our first uh, audience question. This is Eric Watchman from Arizona. Hi, this is Derek Watchman. I am here from Arizona. I represent and chairman of the board for the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development. We represent the Native American businesses around Indian country here in the United States. My question is, uh, Native American communities have been hit hard extremely by COVID-19 with increasing numbers nationwide. Is there any evidence that if someone has recovered from COVID that they could be reinfected? 
So it's a very good question. Um, and really, so far, we've seen very limited evidence of reinfection. Um, you know, there's been several case reports. Um, we've had other examples that I think really drive the message home. We had a, uh, you know, a, say a camp that was uh, uh, very careful about trying to control infection. And what they had is all the campers were self-quarantined before they came to the camp for 14 days. They were all tested uh, and they're all negative. And then they were able to go to the camp. Same with the counselors. They were all tested and they were negative. The camp decided they wanted to have a great camp experience. So they didn't want to have that modulated by something like wearing a mask or not crowding because they felt they quarantined everybody for, um, for two weeks and they tested everybody. And what happened in that camp is there was an, a huge outbreak. Over, I think close to 90% of the campers and the, uh, the counselors all got infected. So just to show you that all that precaution. Um, but what was interesting to get at your question, there was a group of individuals who actually had antibody when they went to that camp. And none of those individuals got infected. So right now we have pretty good evidence that antibody that is, is, is really protective against reinfection. We just don't know for how long. We don't know if that's going to be for six months. We don't know if it's going to be a year. We don't know if it's going to be for two years. We're going to learn all those questions right now. Um, uh, but it's one of the things that gives us, of course, great hope before we knew this, that the vaccines were likely to work. I think it really is a gift uh, that these vaccines, many of us had thought if they worked for 70% efficacy, we would be excited. But to see 95% efficacy for the first two vaccines, roughly, and all the other vaccines are based on the same, uh, what we will call immunological target. Um, I think we have a lot of optimism that antibody directed against those vaccines will be protective for some period of time, which we are going to learn uh, in the future. And infection, natural infection is protective for some period of time. Do you, we have another audience question that's kind of a follow-up to that, which is given the efficacy of these vaccines, do you imagine there's a world where uh, airlines or schools or employers might require proof of vaccination in order to participate live? I think each jurisdiction, I talked for the business roundtable recently, and that question came up directly. Uh, and I think each, uh, you know, institutions are going to, make those decisions. I mean, it's clear I'm a physician and I'm required to take a number of vaccines in order for me to be uh, able to practice in the hospital that I used to work in. I anticipate that, you know, being vaccinated against COVID is going to be another requirement for healthcare professionals. It's potential that I could see that long-term care facilities uh, might require some evidence of, of immunity uh, and, and, and for admission to certain long-term care facilities. Um, uh, I think the you know, airline industry, and you, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, I can see them uh, trying to determine whether they wanna make this a requirement uh, you know, for employment within them. Since unfortunately, even though we get control of, of COVID, which I think we will by the third quarter of this year, um, the pandemic in the world is not going to be controlled for, for multiple years. And so we'll always have a global risk of reintroduction for susceptibles if they haven't been vaccinated. So, you know, it will be a decision I think each industry will make. Um, but I do think um, uh, there are uh, certain industries where I think it would be important to protect their workforce and, and some other industries where it may be important to make sure that they protect their their customers and consumers. So I think uh, as these vaccines get deployed, um, groups will, will wrestle with that, but I won't be surprised if a number of um, occupations uh, or, or situations make vaccination against COVID a requirement. So one of the examples I used in the question was schools. And of course, we have another audience question here that says the CDC, the Pediatrics Association, the WHO want to keep schools open, yet we have districts in the U.S. that won't open. Um, what do we do? It, it does seem that the school trans 
transmission has been lower than we were afraid of when we were first opening schools. Um, what do you think it's going to take to get schools to open and remain open? Yeah, I think it's important. Um, I've tried to say this every ch chance I get, so I'm going to say it again. Um, I think it's important to use data to make those decisions. Um, you know, I was very disappointed in New York uh, when they closed schools, when they hit their 3% uh, point. Because as you pointed out, we now have substantial data that shows that schools, face-to-face -face learning can be conducted in K through 12, and particularly in the elementary and the middle schools um, in, in a safe and responsible way. Um, we've evaluated a number of schools and we're not seeing, as you pointed out, cluster infections within schools in any, any significant way. When we see teachers infected, we're finding that the teachers are infected from their spouses or their community. When we see students in the school infected, we find out that that was an infection that occurred in the community. We're not seeing intra-school transmission. So, you know, again, I've been a big advocate that, and I believe this in my heart, that the public health interest to kids in K through 12 is to have them in face-to-face -face learning for all the reasons we talked about, whether that's where they get their mental health services, where they get food substance programs, where that's where they um, get, um, sadly, that's where we do uh, get reporting from child abuse. Uh, this is where they get significant socialization. Uh, obviously, we've had issues with substance abuse and suicide, as you know. I just think it's healthy for these kids to be in school. That said, they got to do it safely and they got to do it responsibly. And when this was started uh, over the summer, no one really knew for certain. They thought that these public health measures would work. But now the data clearly shows us that you can operate these schools in face-to-face -face learning in a safe and responsible way. So what I've asked, and I say to your chambers, is you know, don't make the decision based on what I say. Look at your schools that have been opened and evaluate and see if they've been a source for major transmission. And so far, when we've looked at this, we've not found schools to be a major source of transmission. You know, we've seen other, other, other sources of transmission, like I mentioned, surprisingly, uh, just family gatherings. Uh, so I do think we should use that data and, um, and, and make decisions, you know, based on data. And right now, uh, and, and I do think it's important that the answer to controlling the uh, COVID pandemic is the answer is not necessarily closure, whether it's schools or business, et cetera. There may be some strategic closures that make sense. I've been a strong advocate that I don't think it's in the best interest of COVID control uh, to have bars open till two o'clock in the morning where people are without their masks drinking in crowded bars that maybe should maybe have 100 people that have 200 people in it. So I do think looking strategically where there could be, but I don't think you know we benefit at all in our nation in controlling COVID by uh, broadly shutting down businesses. Uh, clearly, if schools can learn how to do this safely and responsibly, airlines can learn how to do this safely and responsibly, uh, businesses can learn how to do this safely and responsibly, and, and again, we should use data to define when we've defined an industry that poses a unique risk that may require some type of restrictions rather than these broad restrictions, uh, unfortunately, that happened in the spring and summer. You know, a um, couple of interesting things you said there. One was not a physician and not a public health expert, but as a mom, the other thing I see is that when schools close, the kids try to find other outlets for their social energy, right? Which is not as controlled of a setting as getting to go to school where there are adults making their masks, making them socially distanced, et cetera. So yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, totally, I totally agree with you, Suzanne. And I think one of the greatest tragedies early on was when schools closed, was um, the social disadvantaged individuals that really didn't have the, or the individuals that were in, workforces that didn't have the luxury to telework because they were in some service industry. Um, these mothers, single mothers, well, how they had to deal with it 
was they had their kids then go stay with their mother, which is exactly the opposite of what I want to do in protecting the vulnerable. I don't want to see silent, asymptomatic, infected children to go stay with grandma who might have diabetes or so I think really the, the point is that uh, at least we have the data now. I, and I really want to applaud the, the teachers that um, had the courage to take a chance on the public health advice that was being given, knowing that we were going to be monitoring this very carefully. Um, I also, uh, the parents that had the courage to take the risk, because in the absence of data, it was all opinion. Uh, but that's what I'm saying now. That's what I've obviously said uh, in the New York situation, that um, don't do this, you know, a priori. You know, look at your data. And I'm glad to see that they're reconsidering opening at least the schools for the elementary schools, because the truth is we have enough data now, when I say we, each of these jurisdictions, to show that, that, that elementary schools are not a source of transmission. And I think, you know, I think when the careful studies are done, you're going to see kids who are in virtual learning uh, probably have a higher infection rate than the kids that do face-to-face -face learning. So um, the other thread from that last answer had to do with employers. You know, you said if uh, universities have learned how to do it and airlines have learned how to do it, and we certainly know a lot of businesses have learned how to do it because there are businesses that have never closed. I think this next audience question gets to that. Can we roll that question, please? Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Redfield. I'm Doug Loon, the president of the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Here in Minnesota, we have seen growth in community spread that has actually shown up in the workplace. And this has caused concerns with availability of workers and threatened um, certainty among consumers as well. What can you offer as for advice to employers who wanna work with their employees to limit community spread through their business? Yeah, I think you you raise a really, really important question that goes over all of this, whether it's schools, whether it's businesses, that the key to controlling infection in schools or businesses is just what you said, it's controlling community spread. And how do we control community spread? Um, and I do think it's just gonna come back to, you know, and I don't know, you know, whether a mandate versus non-mandate, but I know leadership matters in terms of messaging and that everyone comes to uh, recognize that, you know, this is a serious situation. You know, I know that if I happen to walk outside uh, of my car, you know, on the way to the airport, you know, from the parking lot, in a nanosecond now, I, I feel like I, I, I you know, I, you know, I didn't put my pants on if I don't have this mask on, you know, and I can tell you when it started, sometimes I got halfway to the gate before I remembered to work and, you know, people were looking at me and, and, and then I realized I didn't have my mask on. I think making that is such a social norm that, uh, and I'm remarkable. I was, uh, you know, I have 11 grandkids now. Uh, the youngest one is two. Um, the truth is all of the ones that are over two, I have three, I think three, four, five, they're all, they're all wearing their masks when they go do their thing. Um, they're very conscious of it. So um, the more that the community can embrace these mitigation steps, um, I think is the more that these businesses can start impacting community spread because that's really where it's coming. Uh, and if they decide to do the strategic testing that I've suggested in some businesses, it also helps them begin to identify in their own workforce, where the silent spread is coming into their workforce. And that becomes a very important, I think, tool of identifying the asymptomatic infected individuals so they don't become an amplifier uh, within the workforce, uh, which we know this virus, unfortunately, this virus is really infectious. Um, I think it's probably the closest thing, and I'm a virologist by training, I think this virus is the closest thing we have to measles we've ever sent, seen. It's interesting that the mitigation we're doing in this country right now, our influenza rates are at historical lows. Now, you know, we're still just about to get into influenza season. So I do uh, really encourage everyone to get influenza vaccine, 
But the reality is our spring season of flu, our summer season of flu, and even our early fall season are historical lows. So these mitigation steps are really helping, even with the fact that we're probably only doing them 50, 60, 70 percent of the American public for flu. But it's not enough to contain COVID. COVID is really, 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 really infectious. And, and uh, unfortunately, the reason it's so infectious, as opposed to flu, is the instrument of transmission is not a sick person with a cough. The instrument of transmission is an asymptomatic 23-year-old that feels great. So let's turn for a minute, Dr. Redfield, and talk about the vaccine for a minute. Another thing we get a lot from employers and chambers of commerce across the country, to associations, is, okay, if early vaccine distribution will go as it should to healthcare workers to the most vulnerable populations um, and then turn to essential workers, how should we be thinking about defining essential worker in that context? You know, um, that's a very good question. As you know, uh, technically, the Department of Homeland Security, you know, kind of makes those classifications, as you know. Um, but obviously, each community uh, in, in each, uh, and I can tell you um, that, you know, someone that supports uh, one, of my, one, of, one of my sons who's in recovery, I try to help one of my daughters that's starting a family, um, Obviously, in my own family, you know, if there's no income coming into the household, uh, there's a problem. So, I mean, everyone, you know, uh, I think can relook at what's really essential to them to be able to maintain their livelihood. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, I really feel strongly that the knee-jerk response uh, that to control COVID somehow we have to uh, close things or limit the economy or limit business. I think, no, the answer is figure out how to operationalize that business in a safe and responsible way. So that, um, and I do think, you know, for me, you know, I actually think teachers are really essential. Um, uh, so I think each community is going to define that there is a technical definition of it by Homeland Security where they've listed and they now do include teachers. Um, uh, so I don't know, Suzanne, if I really answered your question, if you want to angle it, I mean, I think, uh, when I when I see a single mother raising four kids, and she may be doing um, some type of working in a grocery store, uh, or she may be uh, helping uh, you know, provide custodial services. I mean, for her, she's essential for her and her family. I do think this, you know, there is the other aspects of what we need. You know, when we first got into this essential worker issue where CDC came out with guidance that suggested if you were a essential worker and you were exposed and you were asymptomatic, um, that you could return to that essential job as long as you were asymptomatic and you monitored your symptoms, your employer monitored your symptoms and you wore a mask. Um, part of that really came out of when we were in the state of Washington um, on a visit there where they had a significant number of policemen and firefighters and rescue squad workers were all being isolated and they didn't have a fire department. And so this was part of a, trying to give balance uh, that if, uh, you know, there is essential services that are critical to the function, whether it was uh, first responders or whether it's hospital workers, we had one hospital system in, in Washington had over 600 healthcare workers out in quarantine. Um, or, as you know, in some of our industrial work, meatpacking plants, et cetera. So uh, just what we needed. I don't, I don't think this country knows how close we came to having a uh, protein shortage uh, because of uh, the outbreaks that we were having in meatpacking plants. But um, I think it's important for each family to understand that, each group. But I think I've become astutely aware that there are a number of people who work that don't have the luxury that some of us have to be able to continue our work as long as we get on Zoom or we get on uh, you know, a webcast. Uh, a lot of these people have to actually go and, and work, work in, 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 in the environment. And we need to work hard to figure out how to make that safe and responsible. And we need to honor those people. I mean, you can imagine if all the grocery store workers decided they, it was too risky to go to work. 
So I guess I'm a little bit confused. I'm a lot, I'm a lot confused, but in this topic, I'm a little bit confused, which is if DHS has the role of classifying essential workers, but you seem to refer to some of these decisions being made at the local level, who will prioritize, who is in charge of prioritizing vaccine distribution? Yeah. Oh, for vaccine distribution, we can come back to that. But for essential workers, it's it's DHS. I was just trying to make you uh, at least aware that I'm aware that for individual families, there's a, a there's also an arbitrator who they believe is essential. I mean, DHS clearly has the essential ones. Okay. Right. Yeah, got it. And so I was just um, trying to show that I've come to understand that the DHS list doesn't necessarily, I remember a jewelry worker that was supporting his family, he felt keeping his jewelry store was an essential worker because without it, he couldn't support his family. And I'm sure many of you people in commerce understand that, that a lot of the people that have suffered by having businesses closed, um, and I would argue that probably didn't need to be, we didn't do a strategic decision, it was a salami decision. You know, well, everybody will do this rather than stepping back I think now we're much more uh, smart. We have data behind us. These decisions need to be made. Now, when it comes to vaccines, um, you know, clearly the issue, first, it's exciting that we do have a vaccine. I do think people should give credit where credit's due. When this was first suggested that we'd have a vaccine before the end of the year, I don't think uh, people saw that as something that was feasible. Uh, the reality was the mission was assigned to get a vaccine before January 2021. and as you know, we have two vaccines now with EUA uh, uh, submissions. Uh, we have two more vaccines. So we have four vaccines now that are really deep into phase three trials. Um, it's very probable before February we'll have, I think, probably uh, three to four vaccines approved in the United States, uh, which is really remarkable. And I think we'll have two of them approved before the first of the year. Uh, the challenge will be that it's going to be constrained in supply. Um, ultimately, there will be enough vaccine for everybody in, uh, in the United States that wants to get a vaccine to get a vaccine. Uh, I've been I've said publicly that I believe that will be somewhere in the second quarter, third quarter, uh, 2021. It's been criticized by others, but I think those estimates are probably going to be right on target. Uh, I do anticipate the vaccine will be start to be delivered to the American public uh, this month. Uh, currently, the way this will uh, work is we have our advisory committee immunization practices that have made some preliminary recommendations, and they'll be uh, modifying those uh, after the EUAs are approved um, in, in December. But more importantly, uh, we've worked since the summer with each of the 64 jurisdictions of this nation for them to develop what I call the micro distribution plan. How do they? They're going to get allotment of vaccine. Uh, based on a macro distribution plan from the federal government. Uh, and those allotments have been assigned, at least for the first wave of, of vaccine that will be uh, distributed this month. And ultimately, the individual governors and jurisdiction leaders are going to decide what I call the micro distribution. Okay, fine. The ACIP makes recommendations. CDC makes recommendations uh, through the ACIP. But ultimately, it's the local... Uh, governors that uh, and uh, are going to make the decision how that vaccine is going to be distributed uh, in their community. And those vaccine plans have all been developed uh, uh, and worked through uh, over the last three months. Um, and um, I anticipate, uh, you know, that will be a, a, an evolving situation as more and more vaccine becomes available. Uh, and I don't think it will be unified. Uh, you know, that every jurisdiction is going to do exactly the same thing. So you've been pretty clear that you think there's a good chance that we're back at some kind of new normal by the fall, by Q3, um, that, and yet we have some questions from the business community about how they should be planning for earlier in the year. And I think this next question from the audience gets to that. Could we roll that question, please? Hi, Dr. Redfield. I'm Chris Clark, President and CEO of the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, and we are excited and proud to have the CDC headquartered here in the Peach State. You know, a lot of people on the call today are really focused on Q1 and Q2 of next year. 
a lot of us have um, programs, events, uh, receptions that we plan throughout the year. And I'm curious, what advice do you have for us as we try to plan those events for Q1 and Q2? Thank you. Very important question. Uh, I think that we're going to still be heavily in mitigation for um, limiting crowd size, limiting um, gatherings during that during that time frame. Um, so you're going to, I think, want to be um, vigilant and smart about it. You know, outside's better than inside, and smaller is better than bigger. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of jurisdictions, either at the state level or local level, still have very significant uh, guidelines for size of crowds. Um, you know, uh, you can see when I tell you that if 30% of the people in, say, the Dakotas that got tested are positive, that if you have a crowd size of 100 people, um, there's probably a lot of positives in that crowd that you don't know about. And so, and this virus is so, so, so easily transmissible. So really, I think you are going to have to plan. Virtual is going to dominate the scene for the first quarter of 2021. Uh, small limited crowds uh, are going to limit the seed. I don't think you're going to have any um, significant um, grace from people being vaccinated or people having uh, uh, antibody from previous infections. So I do think uh, the first two quarters, uh, particularly the first quarter of 2021, and I think most of the second quarter is still going to be a fairly restrictive uh, environment for us when it comes to crowds, crowd events. I don't think we're going to start getting out of that until the fall of 2021. So let me ask you a, another question. Um, the press is reporting that you may be uh, releasing new guidance on quarantine periods from 14 days to seven days. And I think one of the things you and I talked about backstage that was, true, was um, the clear and consistent guidance is so helpful. And as the science evolves and the data evolves, it's really important that we're spreading good information so the public is getting a consistent viewpoint. So talk to the audience about the quarantine period, if you would. Yeah, I think it's really important. I appreciate, Suzanne, what you said. You know, agencies like ours have to have the courage to change when we have data that says we need to change. And, you know, I will say, you know, I don't, not, not everybody understands that, uh, you know, you know, when we thought this virus was largely transmitted symptomatically, we then thought, well, if you're symptomatic, you wear a mask and that will protect my source control to, so I won't infect you. Well, we didn't realize, you know, back in early March that a lot of the infection was actually asymptomatic. And so therefore, I don't know who's infected. And so if I really want source control, I want everybody to wear a and again, that got into a lot of controversy. How did we change? Well, we changed based on data. So quarantine is, a, you know, and isolation is a key tool, as I mentioned, to try to keep this virus from spreading. And a lot of people never understood when, if I was infected, I was told to isolate for 10 days. But if I was not infected, I was told to isolate for 14 days. And a lot of people suggested that maybe I didn't make any sense because why do I isolate for only 10 days if I am infected and I isolate for 14 days if I'm not infected. And the reason for that is if I know I'm infected, either I got tested and I was asymptomatic or if I got symptomatic and got tested, we know that the, the virus uh, shedding within the body in an individual's infected really does uh, um, become neg negligible at 10 days. And that's why we were able to have people test out of quarantine when they were infected at 10 days. But the problem with people who are exposed, we don't know if you're exposed, when does your body start to replicate the virus? And originally we had studies that said the average was 5.2 days. And then later we had studies that said it was seven point, I think something, somewhere in the seven days. And so we only had data to really look at when was the probability that I was not going to somehow start shedding the virus? And it turned out that the 
greatest probability that we would not miss anybody was 14 days. And that's why we have. It. Now, we've since done a number of studies because there's, you know, obviously 14 days quarantine has an impact on productivity. 14 days quarantine also has an impact on whether people quarantine. Uh, and we've done a lot of studies um, over the spring and summer and that we were able to get enough data then that we could model. And we, you are right today, actually, uh, the new guidance will be coming out uh, from CDC. I think they're doing a press thing uh, as we speak. Um, and that guidance is, again, based on data that we gathered and modeling of that data that if you isolate for 10 days, that the probability that you will um, start replicating a virus after that is about 1%. And so it's a balance. It's not that 14 days is bad. It's just that how does society want to balance it? Do you want to get 99.9% or if we're 99%, is that good enough at 10 days? And that model also shows that if you test, and we've done this with the SEC uh, football leagues uh, in, in trying to gather all this data and some other college groups, um, if we test at day five, six, or seven and you're negative, um, it's, it's about the model would predict that we, we will we'll define at least 95% of the individuals. So CDC now is coming out with guidance today to allow people to make those, those judgments that they can test out at, 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 at seven days um, and they can get out at 10 days. Um, but at the same time, if they want to be perfect, you know, closest to perfect, they can stay in isolation for 14 days. So that will be coming out today. I think it's going to make a big impact. We found a lot of people really don't isolate for 14 days. And, you know, and I think getting people to commit to this, getting out of the transmission cycle, um, I think is important. So uh, that's the data that will be coming out today. Seven days with a test between day five and day seven and 10 days without a test. It feels really um, important, right, that we, especially with the community leaders on this call and the business leaders on this call, that we're really getting out this information and that when information changes, it's because we've learned more, we've studied more, you know, and that that's a good thing and, uh, and that we're trying to balance economic health and public health and they're very intertwined as we've referred to here and keeping people out of work and out of school also has health consequences. So, that's right. I think balancing this is so important and so hard. So, so let me try to, to end on, on a positive note, which is, well, I'm hoping it's a positive note. Maybe I'm leading the witness here, but do you think that our experiences as a country with COVID-19 will help us prepare for the next crisis, which, which seems sure to come in some ways? And do you feel that we're learning something? As a, We just talked about how the scientists and doctors are learning as they go. Do you think the public is learning too? I think there's a lot of lessons here, Suzanne. Uh, the first one, you know, that I want to emphasize because my time as CDC director is coming to an end in January. Um, this nation was severely underprepared for this pandemic, and I think we have to call it the way it is. Um, when I became CDC director, I was um, I wasn't prepared to understand how little investment had been made in the core capabilities of public health at what is the premier public health institution in our nation, the premier public health nation in the, na in the country. But we, didn't, we, we really have not invested where we need to be in data, data analytics and predictive data analysis. We really haven't invested in what I call laboratory resilience uh, to make sure that our public health capacity has multiple platforms. When we rolled out our original test, despite all the news, it was not botched. That test worked the day we did it and the day we, uh, uh, and to this day, what was, uh, where there was an, uh, a problem is when we manufactured the test for the public health labs around the country so they didn't have to send it, one of the reagents had a, had a, a technical flaw, either contamination or actually a design flaw, which was corrected over the next five weeks. And since then, the public health communities had that, but we had no resilience. We developed that test on a flu platform, which was a low throughput platform. So none of these public health labs had high throughput uh, capacity. 
Uh, and there was no resilience in laboratory technicians if they wanted to do any search in public health workforce. I had some states that their public health contact tracing workforce was less than 50 people. So there's a huge lack of investment, which I hope uh, this pandemic uh, will change. On the other hand, I am concerned that as the vaccine comes through and we get this behind us, people may forget. And I've had lots of congressional testimonies on this issue um, that this pandemic is going to cost this nation straight out probably about $8 trillion. And then, as you all know, the indirect cost, and Larry Kudlow and others would say in terms of the economy, maybe another $15, $20 trillion. Um, it would seem wise for us to invest the, you know, $100 billion that we need to invest across the nation. Remember, CDC, uh, most of our funding actually goes to the local, state, territorial, tribal health departments. And if you look at it, in many of the states, we're the dominant funder of the public health infrastructure of both state or local community. That has to be invested in. So that's the first lesson, not to let that go by and, um, and really realize uh, it's time for this nation to have the public health system that uh, not only we need, but we deserve. And uh, I hope that's one big lesson. Second lesson for the public, I think, and, and it's a painful lesson, um, is how critical it is, is to have harmony and messaging. When you really want to get everybody on board, you got to have clear, unified, reinforced messaging. And I think the fact that we're still we're arguing in the summer about whether or not masks work or not uh, was a problem. I think the fact that we are arguing about non-surgical, I mean, the fact that we closed healthcare, we didn't need to close healthcare. We needed to maybe close some elect, you know, elective cosmetic surgery but we didn't need to have 85% of the kids not get vaccinated their vaccination series. We didn't need to see uh, individuals uh, no longer seek emergency care. And we saw many more heart attacks at home uh, than we did in, in, in people going to the hospital. We didn't need to see cancer screening stuff. So it needed to be much more thoughtful, much more surgical, much more data driven. And I would say the same for the economy. You know, we didn't need to have a broad shutdown of the American economy. We needed to have a surgical, thoughtful, data-driven um, approach that was able to validate the necessity. We didn't need to shut down schools. Uh, but so I think hopefully what we'll be able to learn is that it's, it's important to be thoughtful, step back, you know, not have a tendency to uh, as I said, the salami approach is we're going to do it for everything. I think, you know, people that fought to get the schools open, like myself, we never wanted the schools opened on safely. And we never wanted them open irresponsibly. We wanted to work to figure out how to keep them open safely and responsibly because we believe they were great public health value. I would say the same thing about business. You know, we, there's, you know, our nation runs on business and probably one of the greatest casualties of the pandemic this year was the impact on the business community. And as I mentioned, the impact on, on just general health care, the impact on our children's education. Uh, these, to me, um, are extremely significant. So I think that's a lesson too. Consistency in messaging and thoughtful surgical interventions that are clearly designed uh, based on data that they're, they have a critical role in helping us impact the epidemic. But I think you're going to see a lot of books written on this. You know, you know I know I'm going to do a lot of reflection when I get out in January, because I do think that's the key that we owe the next group is what did we learn? So what did we learn that works? What did we learn that it didn't work uh, so that the next time this happens, and there will be a next time um, this happens, this nation's much more prepared. Uh, I will say the last thing I'll just say is we should celebrate 
we really should celebrate the innovation that was brought to bear on this. I and mean, when you think about it, we have these vaccines now. I said two will be approved before the end of the year, two more probably very soon after that. You know, we have five vaccines now that are, you know, moving through the system. When you look at the new therapeutics, when I was sitting here, um, you know, last, say, March and April, I don't know how many of you know this, but 27% of all deaths in America in April were caused by COVID. 27%, right? And now today it's about 11%, which is still huge. Normally, uh, you know, we would think these pulmonary deaths would account for about 6%, uh, but COVID and pulmonary like illness now, but it was 27%. The mortality in someone over the age of 70 was uh, over 25% which is not really good. You had a one in four chance of dying. Uh, and I think enormous impact with the new therapeutics that have been developed, both the monoclonal antibodies, redesivir, some of the anti-inflammatory strategies, um, and now you know the potential for convalescent plasma. Many of these therapies too, and you're gonna hear more about it from us, I think this week. Many of these therapies, whether it's monoclonal antibody or, or convalescent plasma, they actually, and even remdesivir, these drugs need, these therapies need to be given before you get sick enough to go to the hospital. As soon as you get diagnosed, you need to be able to get into care and get treated. They work to keep you from uh, having to go into the hospital. There's two phases of the illness, the virus, and then there's the inflammation. And the time the virus is in charge, when you're still out of the hospital, that's when we need to hit hard with therapy. But we now have mortality in the 70 year olds probably somewhere between three and 8%. And then again, it's to celebrate the innovation uh, that this nation has brought to bear. But that innovation won't get us where we need to go if we don't come back to what I said before. We need a public health system that's robust and surge can surge. And it needs to be throughout the nation. And we need to have consistency of messaging so that the American public will come along with us when we're trying to articulate what are the critical mitigation steps that we all need to take to beat this pandemic. Well, thank you so much for all of that. I hope you will come back and help us get out clear and consistent messaging about the efficacy of vaccines when it's time in Q1 for us all to be thinking about that. Um, in the meantime, I think the country also needs more calm wisdom from people like you. So we're so appreciative of your message today, of your hard work and service to our country and its citizens. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thanks a lot, Susan. Thanks for the time. And I just want to say to our audience, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, you can catch past episodes at uschamberfoundation.org or on YouTube. Um, please stay safe, uh, wash your hands, wear a mask, get your flu shot, and, uh, and take really good care of yourselves and each other. We'll see you again soon.